praise the Lord, we're in Romans. <laughs> Where else would we be? It's Wednesday. I thank God upon every remembrance of you that if you are seeking to serve or desiring to be led of the Lord, that you come together with those saints from abroad and from all over the world to join together to reach out to God Almighty and to ask Him to teach us, to lead us in the way that He would have us to go so that we would know His Word in such a way that we would look forward to it and be excited when we get a chance and an opportunity to come together, as it were, all of us joined by the Holy Spirit to become one in the Spirit, one in the Lord, to understand, really, what the things of the Spirit are, what the things of God are, what God has in store for us. Because that's why I do this, why I get excited about studying the Word of God, why I do all that I do, you know, Vidivo, is because I choose to be used by the Holy Spirit in such a way that I delight in His Word. I look forward to sharing it, to explaining the parts that are amazing, that are exciting, that really look so intently and intensely as though they were written just for me, that I'm amazed that anyone else gets anything out of it. Or if they do, I'm amazed that they didn't get it in the first place. You see, there's nothing special about me, because you could be doing the same thing too. As a matter of fact, I exhort you, brethren, by the mercies of our God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. After all, that is right and true that God should expect you to do what he has told you to do for the moment you got saved. You see, if you haven't gone out and begun to teach, if you haven't gone out and begun to preach, if you haven't taken the word of God that you heard when you got saved, and begun to use it in your life, then dare I say you need to get on with it and get over yourself and get on with it in the kingdom of God. Because except you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, you'll never really enter into all the things that God has in store for you. As a matter of fact, until you actually share, care, and dare to be there for another person besides yourself, you're really not a disciple of Jesus Christ. Because it's easy to say, oh, I'm a Christian. And everybody does. But it's quite another thing when you have to go out and demonstrate and reveal exactly who you are by what you do and not just what you say. So, Father, I thank you that this is the day that you have made. I thank you that this is the word that you have given, that God, this is your spirit that it dwells inside of us. Because if it were of us, we would be about our own thing. We would go out and play football games. We would make spiritual goulash out of the Word of God and invent things about ourselves and make ourselves the center of attention when we know God, that the entire Word of God is devoted back to the Son of God. And though, God, I pray you'll lead us in that way, that we should look into your Word, that we should understand what we've heard, that we should realize and make real in our lives that with which you've given us, your word, that you've revealed your son to us, that we can know Jesus personally and intimately, that we could hear what you have to say by way of the son speaking to us through the spirit of God. As we ask this, we commit it unto you, Jesus, that you would lead us and guide us and abide with us and make us one in your spirit till the day we become one in the Lord. Amen. And you know, I was thinking about that little heart thing, you know, you ever seen that little heart thing, you know, people do? You know, it's kind of like the heart beating, you know, it's kind of like, well, I always do this. I always take my hands, you know, and you put them down here because it's like from the very breastplate of where you're at, your breastplate of righteousness. Because a lot of people are self-righteous, you know, they'll beat their chest. That's why it's called the breastplate of righteousness, because when you're self-righteous, you're puffed up. You know, you beat your own chest, you beat your own drum. But if you took your two hands and you kind of put them back to back, then you can't do something with these hands. You see, they're helpless. So you kind of like... Put them right here in the middle of your chest. And then you just kind of go upward like this. You curl it outward. You bring it back down around. And you bring it back together to make a heart. But it also puts your hands together to pray. Because really that's what we should be doing is making our heart an object of prayer to God. That we would ask Him to come inside us. That we would learn to listen to Him who dwells within us. 
that we would know that God is with us always. And that's what the book of Romans is all about. We've been looking in the book of Romans about Paul and Jesus and the gospel and what an apostle is and what being separated to the gospel is and what he had promised before by the prophets and what he had done with his son and how he is Lord and how he was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. But I want to read this over again because we're taking our time going through it line upon line, even word upon word, so that we get the most from the least that we possibly can because then we're gleaning, as it were. We're chewing on it. We're intensely endeavoring to understand every little part so that when it's jointly fit together inside of us, there's no doubt about who we know. It's Jesus because it ain't us. So the fact of the matter is, in reading, we're going to look at Romans chapter 1 through verse 6, which we've been reading over and over and over again. But brethren, I have no problem with putting you in remembrance of these things. Blessed are you if you do that with which you have heard. So, yes, we're going very slowly. <laughs> As a matter of fact, today our focus, what we're getting intensely aware of, what we're going to really zero in on, like an arrow in a bullseye, like your gun, where are you going to put that crosshairs? What are you going to hit as a target? We're going to focus in on this one phrase, this little phrase that we find here in verse 4. Declare to be the Son of God. I like that. Declare to be the Son of God. So let's read it. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom you are also the called of Jesus Christ. I like that last line, among whom you are also called, or you're among whom you are also the called of Jesus Christ. Did you know that God called you? From the moment that you got saved, God called you, and he called out and he said to the whole world, Behold, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Behold, I just raised Jesus from the dead. Pay attention to him. Behold, Jesus said, I've come. Put your hands in my flesh. Pierce my side. You can do that. I'm alive. I'm not dead. My God is not dead. He's surely alive. He's living all about the outside and the inside. He's all around the town. As a matter of fact, he's up there. He's in here. He's over there, and he's everywhere. Because when God wants to appear, God appears. When God wants to speak, people listen. When God wants to reveal his word, we ought to pay attention. And that's why we look at the scripture and we go through it so slowly, because looking back at verse 4, we're, we're deciding to look in closely at that declared to be the Son of God. As though this were a topical study, which you could say it's a topical, because to be on topic is to be focused in on who is it about, what is it about, how can we get something out of it for ourselves, that might be important for us to know to live our lives according to the word of God as not according to the word of man. That we might do something with his plan that works out in our lives so that we could accomplish his will so that he would be satisfied with our lives as we lift it up to him as a living sacrifice. And I beseech you therefore, brethren, as we said at the beginning, that you present yourselves a living sacrifice holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, because Jesus died for you. He gave you salvation. He provided you his spirit. He's given you everything you could possibly need or imagine if you're willing to receive it. Are you? And it's interesting because Romans, the book itself, is a lot like the Americans today. Americans today are pretty much thinking they got it their own way. You know, there's the Roman road, the Roman rule, the Roman way, you know, Roman meal bread. Oh, well, okay, maybe that's not around anymore. Maybe it is. There's Roman commerce, there's Roman democracy, there's Roman everything, and that's kind of what Americans are like today. There's the American Christian, the American way, American democracy, American free enterprise, 
American armies, American tourists, ooh, the ugly Americans, you know. Well, they're them too, you know. But there's also those other things that are part of the American tradition. Christians being sent out from the nation to go out and to touch other people's lives. Christians going into the other parts of the world, even to the very Congo itself and beginning churches and beginning Bible schools. Christians going into South America, some of them missionaries dying, some of them living, some of them going on and carrying on the work that we ought all to be doing because we're all called, as it says in verse 6. But you know, I think about called to be or called or declared to be the Son of God. Declared to be the Son of God with power. That's what's interesting. You know, it's the time of the season when we ought to know what our declaration is. Not the Declaration of Independence. That's something that's just kind of like, you know, some people getting together wanting to rebel against authority. No, God introduced something about his authority. He declared his son. And the way that he did it was that he, at a forementioned time, at a specific purpose and design, when it was right in his own eyes, he caused a virgin to be found with child. It doesn't say that she went out and got pregnant. It doesn't say that she went out and somehow had intercourse. No, as a matter of fact, it says she was found to be with that child from the Holy Spirit. So God, the Creator, created in her life and created a body for the Spirit of God to cause the Son of God to be dwelling with us, to be dwelling physically in Mary. It would be amazing to me to conceive of that thought for any woman, if I were a woman myself, that God dwells in me. And yet, if you think about that, God does dwell in you. God dwells in you right now by His Spirit, and the Holy Spirit has conceived in you the same nature with which inside of you, man and woman, the Spirit of God has caused the Son of God to live. And God is in us, and God is with us. So it's not that shocking, but in some ways it's amazing to me to realize that the declaration that we're talking about, declared to be the Son of God, went forth before he was born. As a matter of fact, one of the greatest things we look forward to at a winter season is the star looking up to see if there's a light in the heavens, which for some people, you know, they have to get some kind of, you know, idea that, well, it was a comet. No, it wasn't. Well, it was a star. No, no, it wasn't. Well, it was this, that, or the other thing. And they have all these astronomical, constellational, projectional ideas of what it was or what it is. Now, God put stars in the sky, and he put the, you know, comets, and he put the asteroids and the meteorites and everything in the universe physically for a purpose. And he designed it in such a way that we could look at it and see his handiwork, that he has done those things physically. But you see, when there's light, it's interesting because... Once we read the examination of the star of Bethlehem, or the sign of his coming, we realize there's something more about that star than meets the eye. It isn't enough to say that, well, in that constellation you know, of Orion, and where the king was going to come, there would be a king born in Israel, and that the wise men were able to determine there was a light in the heavens that they didn't see. The amazing thing about the star is it came down and dwelt where the sun was. Now... Part of the star, the story of the star, of course, might be there was a, you know, like I have a star right now. My wife knows very much so that in the winters, I look out in the heavens and I see a certain star. And I use it as a focal point. God causes me to think, hey, that's my star. That's the one that God gave me when he wants to inspire me to remind me the sign of his coming. Because the sign of his coming is a star. There is that with which Jesus said, what was the sign of his coming? There would be a Light in the heavens declaring that the soon return of the king, or the king is coming. As a matter of fact, we should be declaring to the world right now, the king is coming. We should be saying over and over again, Jesus is coming. Guess what? Look out there. There's a star. Yeah, well, I see a star, and I think that that's him. And I have had times in prayer, and much times in miraculous circumstances, where with that star, oh yeah, you know, it was like, oh, wow. You know, either we're having a dimensional reality shift, that somehow quantum physics has taken over and somehow that light has gotten closer and that little speck that I thought was just a star out there has suddenly become enveloping and now I'm enveloped in some kind of stairway that seems to be able to open itself within the transducent or translucent 
interdimensional reality that I'm able to kind of like ascend upward as though I were ascending into the heavens, as though I were going upward, being brought up and the angels descending and ascending, you know, and I'm able to walk up into that pathway of light coming forward unto Jesus Christ himself and seeing that there's an angel there at the end of that light that's saying, come up hither, and I'm going, whoa! Yeah, that's me. <laughs> I don't know where you're going, but baby, I know where I've been. <laughs> yeah! Oh, man, you got so much more to experience than you've ever dreamed of. Because guess what? Yes, God uses physical things as part of the picture. But when that star came and dwelt where the Son of God was, when the three wise men came to Herod and afterwards were being led to the stable to where the child was, it was an angel. There's no doubt about it. You can read the scriptures. It's pretty simple to read that in Luke and to determine for yourself what, where, why, and how that light could have gone from, oh, it's shining down. No, that's not what it says. I'm sorry. Uh, you know. You can go with your physical, you know, explanations of everything that's supernatural or everything that is God natural that I know for a fact that, yes, behind that light, the angel that descended through the light that came out of that same place that they were looking in that constellation in order to determine that there would be a king born in Jerusalem in that particular time in that particular place and that this was a new star and this was a sign of his coming and that it was placed in the heavens so they could look at it and see it. It's not the star of them either, but that they could see that. And that behind that light was, G, was the angel coming down that would be the messenger of God. That was Gabriel who came down through that light from that star as a light, opened up the heavens, came through, was translucent, came and saw, and the angels with him declared that God, behold, born unto you this day in the city of David, a Savior, Jesus Christ our Lord, declared unto God, behold, yeah, you know the prophecy. You hear it every nativity. That's the prophecy. Fulfillment, declared to be the Son of God. We know that God provided salvation because it says he shall save his people. We know that God said that with the angels because the shepherds were telling us that. We have this story recorded for us. Anybody that's watched the Peanuts, Charlie Brown Christmas, knows full well the story of who was declared to be the Son of God? For behold, born unto you in the city of David, a king, a savior, Jesus Christ our Lord. And so, declared to be the Son of God is very interesting to me because every time I hear a declaration, I don't think of independence. I think of dependence. Matter of fact, every time I read somebody telling me that they want to declare their independence, I laugh at them. I think, wow, boy, are you in for a big surprise. I don't want to be independent. I want to be dependent upon God. I want to find myself in that interdependence of interlocutional, locational, positional reality of God being in me, that I am in him and we are one so that together we have joined with the Son that we would be one in the Spirit, one in the Lord. In other words, he who has been, according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, by power declared to be the Son of God. Because he was raised from the dead, then I can be raised from the dead. Because of the power that raised him from the dead, I can be raised from the dead. Because it is from that spirit of holiness, I can be holy. He's declared by God to be the Son of God. And it amazes me that we look at Romans and we don't realize how much of that declaration goes on all through the scripture. How many times has God declared who his son is? How many times did the prophets declare what his son is? How many times have we known for a fact in our life he's just Jesus? Or are we declaring that he's the son of God? Now be careful. You see, declared to be the son of God, Paul knew. Because Paul went forward and demonstrated that by his life. He gave up his life in order to follow the son of God and God knocked him off his horse. Are you willing to do the same? Have you declared to anyone the Son of God, that Jesus is declared the Son of God. Because that's what this season is about. You see, Christmas isn't about the Christ Mass, the Mass that was given in order to celebrate the Advent, which is the time of this year that the coming of the Lord is near, that we should be looking to the, 
what do they call it? The, the, the nativity is called the inception. The, 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 the celebration of the inception of God into the intervention of the events of mankind by way of providing a salvation through the baby, through the nativity, through the child becoming flesh that was man of God in heaven that existed prior to his coming into the world, that once he came into the world was purely human and fully God, that in this inception that we celebrate during the Advent season, which is why we can say happy seasons or happy holidays or have a good Advent, is that we celebrate that time with the Advent candles and with those things that I don't even know what they are really because I don't do Advent, but those times of the season that we get together in order to remember when God came down, when God reached his hand down and said, I will provide salvation in this, a baby? And the wise men were amazed. Behold, the king, he cometh, not as lowly and upon an ass as he would ride 30 years later into Jerusalem. And they would be amazed at his humility and his sensitivity and his tenderness. What people call today Jesus the doormat or Jesus the wussy. I got news for you. My God is not a wuss. My God is the perfect demonstration of the sensitivity of God, the love of God, and how God is love. And if you want to see the power of God, then you see it in the tenderness and the weakness and the meekness of that baby who could have been slaughtered as all those who were in that city eventually were died by way of the hand of man who had come across the prophecy that said that they would be born in the city of David in Bethlehem. And so Herod made sure that all those children died all the way up until three years. So my power that I see so divine with God removing that might of strength that people want today, that violent nature that people want to see, yeah, my God's tough. He's rough. He beats him to death. He'll kill him. No, my God is meek and lowly. My God's a doormat. As a matter of fact, if you want to walk on Jesus, he'll let you because he'll say, come unto me, I will save you. Come unto me, I will help you. Come unto me, I will love you. Because if you can't get it any other way, then you walk on Jesus and see what happens. Because he'll wash your feet. He'll change your heart. He'll change your mind. He'll open you up to that love divine that you think that is oh so weak. When reality, if you take a fist, and how are you going to conquer a fist? When really, every foolish creature, created being, every enemy of God under the heavens that think that they're protected by something like a fist, when reality, the hand of God could just go, poof, and you're dissolved. Because he holds all things together by his own might. Because he is the Son of God. So... We look at Romans and we understand that, yeah, in those days, they, they liked their gladiators. They liked their football. You know, they liked their baseball. They liked their sports. They liked their violence. But God didn't declare to them the king that was coming. God didn't go out and say, hey, check it out, football players. Come on, man. Bring the team. Get in the bus. We're going to go check out where the king is born. No. God didn't open up the skies and write it with fiery, you know, letters that they should declare on the, the megadome, you know, and the big domes that have the TVs, you know, that you can see everything, didn't broadcast it so that everyone knew, oh, yeah, we saw the writing in the sky, you know, it was God's finger, you know, and he, he recorded it so that we could all see and know and are amazed. No. What God did when he wanted to declare the Son of God, he revealed it to shepherds tending their flocks. They were out and about. It's interesting because a lot of people don't realize that shepherds out and about, you know, they, they treat it different ways and they think of it different perspectives and they look at it from different angles. But because we're talking about today, I, I would say that the person you really want to talk to is probably a migrant worker. It's probably someone who's out there on the street, who's really just trying to make a living, who's just trying to get by. He doesn't want to be beat up because he's, you know, illegal alien or that he's finally got some kind of citizenship. He just wants to do his work and, you know, eat, drink and get by. 
He doesn't want to have the great, you know, kingdoms that we see Americans having nowadays. He doesn't want to get all the money in the world. No, he just wants to provide for his family. It's kind of like shepherds do. You know, they're able to just make ends meet. You know, they're able to just get by. They just work their job consistently, persistently, every day, going and doing the same thing. As a matter of fact, they're probably the most boring people in the world. And if you've ever gone by migrant workers when they're out working in the fields, or if you've ever gone by menial labor, they're just working. And a person who's just working is just doing their job. You see, that's what the shepherds were doing. They were just doing their job. They were just existing on the land, thankful for what job they had, and they were able to eat, they were able to get by, they were able to provide for themselves, they were able to take care of their own life. And they were doing their job, just like maybe you and I. Maybe you're just doing your job and you're just, you know, you don't got a lot of money. You know, you're not one of those rich Christians, you know, who's running around with all the thousands of Bible studies, you know, and you can go on Christian cruises, and you got your Christian Harley, and you can sign up for your Christian Bible school, you know, and you can go to your Christian, you know, conglomerated messes that we call, I don't even know, let's see, what do we call them? Uh, they're not counseling sessions, they're the, I don't know, I can't even think of what it's called. Conferences, oh yeah, the big giant conferences, you know. $10, $20, $50, $100, you know, the charge ones, you know. We don't want to get the riffraff in here. We want to get only the people that can afford to pay. Let's don't make it free. And yet God declared to these people, the poor, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God, declared to them, born unto you this day. And so they went and saw them. They went to check it out. They went to go see what it was that God had said, because he'd already said he was declared to be the Son of God. He'd already been told that this is what was going to happen, and it was revealed with, just like it says here in Romans, power of God. Whoa. Did you see what I saw? Do you hear what I hear? Did you check that out? Do you hear what I hear? Said the shepherd to the other shepherd. Uh, yeah, but don't look up. Oh, my God. It's Hades Comet. No, it's not Hades Comet. Oh, my God. It's, you know, that new comet. You know, whichever one they got lately. Kohotek. Nope, not Kohotek. Oh, it's, wow, look at all the stars falling from the sky. Wow, look at all the rainbow effects. Wow. No, it's not comets. It's not starlight tights. It's not the space lab falling down. Oh, my God. Oh. Did you? you hear him? Did you see him? Did, did you hear what he said? I, well, you know, I'd like to tell you that it's kind of like, you know, not an angel. I, I, I really want to tell you, it's not, we're not seeing, the, we're, I want to tell you we're seeing things. I really do. I think we drank too much last night. You know, we, we got a hangover and really that's not an angel standing right there and we're not talking to him and he's not listening and he's not watching and he's not telling us anything. It's really not an angel, seriously. It's just something natural. It's not a miracle. No, it's not God coming in the form of an angel and telling us these things. No, we probably better not look up because... <gasps> oh, my God. Wow. Declare to be the Son of God. It's funny how easy we take it for granted. The things that go on every day. You see, I see Jesus every day. I do. I don't have a problem looking around this room right now and telling you that where my God has walked, where my God has talked, where my God has spent time a moment just glancing at little things that I do or rearranging little things I've done. Hmm. He does that sometimes too and blesses me with the little things because for me, they're big things because I can see God moving in my life every day. I can see where he arranges the things and the circumstances of my life in such a way that I delight in seeing what he's going to do. When he opens up opportunities that I see as his hand moving by way of his providential will, or I see him working by way of his intervention, when he does take something as miraculous as maybe parting the clouds for a moment and lifting them up, and I look and I go, oh my God. And God reveals himself. Because, you see, I have that expectation. 
I have that realization that God does do that every day. He intervenes in such a way that if we are looking for him, we shall see him. For we shall see him as he is. And I know when the Son of God appears that I shall see him and I shall be like him. And he shall be like me and that I shall be made unto like him the Son of God. Because he's promised me that. And so because I'm looking up and I'm looking out and I'm looking for God every day in you and in me and in people around me, in the circumstances of my plant life, in the circumstances of my personal life, in all the practical things and in the very word of God itself, in everywhere and in everything, I'm looking for Jesus. I know that I'll see him when he comes. I'm ready to be taken away, to be reaching out with my hand up there to say, grab me, Lord, I'm ready to be snatched away. Take me now, I'm not looking back. Are you like that? Are you declared, will you be declared by those around you to be the Son of God? Because that's really what this is all about. That's really what God wants us to be learning from in verse 4. Declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of Holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. Are you dead to the world? Dead to the things of the world? Dead to your own flesh? Dead to your own desires? Dead to your own wants? Or are you out there trying to build a career, build a nation, and save, you know, the world, and save the country, and save the people, you know, and save this, and save that, and save the whales, and save the cats, and save the dogs, you know, and save the ants, you know, and save the trees, you know, and save your health, you know, and save your wealth, and, you know, just busy about every other thing. Can I suggest something to you? When God said, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him, did you ever get on the cross and die? Because that's what happened to the Son of God. You see, the Son of God was raised with power by the Spirit of Holiness, raised from the dead and declared to be the Son of God with power. God wants to take your life after you become a Christian, because this is written to the Romans. He wants to take your life, old Christian, and have you crucify it again, to crawl back up there and to say, hey, God, I give you my life, all that I am. I want it to be a living sacrifice. I don't want to come down off this cross if it's anything between you and me. But that's not who you are, is it? You see, what God declares you to be is Romans. And we're looking at the book of Romans for a reason, and we're going slowly through it, because you're going to find you're not as spiritual as you think you are. You're not as holy as you think you are. You're not as a Roman Christian, possibly, as you thought. Or maybe you are. And that's not a good thing. I got news for you. Paul was writing to the Romans on the one hand to bless them, on the other hand to instruct them, between both hands to compress them, and to between the hands of God to make them realize that they needed to lay down their lives and to give it back to God because they had taken up the world and its ways. Where are you today? What is God declaring about you? Has God found in you that freedom to let it all go? That realization that you could kick back and you know what? Today you could sit back and you could just let God be in control. I mean, can you do that? Or do you have a job to go to? Do you have a family to provide for? You can't tell your loved ones. Um, God wants me to be still for a moment. Sorry, but I know it doesn't make any sense, but... I've got news for you. we got to get up and we're going to move. Yep, that's, that's it. We're going to move out of this land where we've been, not as an opportunity to go get something from somewhere or to search out all the different lands so that we could have our ministry, but rather God is telling me to go without knowing where I'm going. God is telling me to become something that I've never been before. God is telling me that it's not about what I think I am, but it's what he wants to make me. Well, then, Abraham, let me congratulate you on what God is doing. But you see, there's a lot of people that aren't doing that today. They've got the gist of what Christianity is about and they've reworded it and reworked it into a way that's palatable. You know, it makes it taste good. It makes it, mm, needs a little salt, but you know, it's, it's okay, we can eat it. You know, maybe, maybe it doesn't have much salt, you know, and maybe it could use more salt, but we could eat it. It's got that sugary kind of flavor. You know, it's the gospel. I mean, it says that Jesus died, Jesus rose from the dead, and Jesus is coming again, just not soon. And that Jesus will, you know, have us accountable, but not now. 
you know, and that Jesus is going to return and ask us to do, have we done the things he said? But, you know, we can still do what we want to do now. You know, I mean, after all, we've interpreted him in a way that we don't have to do what he said. We just have to live according to what we think he meant. And so we find ourselves as Romans being taught again by Paul, being spoken to by an apostle, being reminded of what the gospel is, of why Jesus was called the Son of God. You see, if he was a son, he learned obedience by the things that he suffered, we're told. If he was a son, then he suffered stripes so that we would be healed. If he was a son, then he suffered the loss of all things that we might gain all things. If he was a son, then he asked us to do the same things that he's done. And that if they've done it to the master, they'll do it to the servants of his. So are you one of his? Or have you become one of these that Paul is talking to, the Romans? Are you an American that God is talking to and you become prosperous in your way? Oh yeah, you could always use more. You're in debt, but you're still prosperous. Do you have more than one car, more than one job? Do you have, you know, a house, a home, a car, a vocation, an avocation? Oh, but you're complaining because guess what? You know, that health care law, oh, no, that's bad. That's bad. After all, we never had health care when we were growing up, but that's bad. Oh, 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 well, that's right. Mom didn't have health care. Wow, well, neither did Dad. Hmm. Or maybe one of yours did, but very few, because I know I'm a baby boy. I know when health care started. Socialized medicine is not something that's negative. As a matter of fact, Christians were the ones that first started socialized medicine. The Obamacare that people are arguing about ought to be the Christian care that God wants us to be about. Because perfect religion is that we would take care of those that are sick and needy and poor and hungry and destitute. And that are in health crisis. That's what every church should be doing. Because you see, if there's someone that's dying in your city, you are the one that you're accountable for, not me. I'm accountable for the ones right here, right now, or in my place. We are the ones, as Christians, to provide for that. Because, after all, can't we lay hands upon them and they'd be healed? Oh, well, that doesn't happen anymore. Really? Why are we reading the Word of God, then? Why do we read the Bible? Why do we believe in God? Is God dead? Because I've heard a pastor tell me that. And God doesn't do that anymore. I'm sorry. You know, God doesn't do miracles. He doesn't heal. And yet I live on the internet. I every day am sharing with Christians and people and praying for them that are recovering with testimonies and stories and x-rays and proof and evidentiary that a court of law today physically would prove a miracle happened. Because they've got the witness and the testimony and they're out screaming it on the top of their lungs. And yet I still have somebody tell me that you know, God doesn't work that way today. I'm sorry. You know, it's not how the Holy Spirit works. Excuse me? With power, God raised him from the dead? With power, this is how we know that he is the Son of God? With power, we understand that Jesus came back from the dead? I know what kind of power people are doing in America today. And it's not from the Spirit of God, but it's the power of this world. The power to be enticed and led astray. So what can we say to these things that we ought to be doing? How can we rearrange our life according to this word that we've been given? How can we understand that principle that God has said, I want you to be declared to be the Son of God. I want you to have the spirit of holiness. I want you, period. Because that's what Jesus said in the book of Revelation when he was standing on the outside knocking. I don't have you. I'm not in you. I'm not with you. Father, I pray that if I gave an invitation that people would obviously want to say, well, yeah, you know, we will do those things, but they don't do it. So God, I'm just praying now without them knowing we were going to pray. God, get them. You got them by the, the scruff of the neck. Shake them. Bake them. Make them. Rearrange them. Squash them. Stomp them. Romp on them. Chomp on them. But God, make them into be the sons and daughters of God that they ought to be. In Jesus' name, amen. So I do, you know, exhort you, brethren, by the mercies of our God that has saved us, by the mercies of our God that has given us Jesus at this time of year, 
for salvation that as he came, declared to be the Son of God as a baby in the nativity by the inception of the immaculate conception that God caused the perception of mankind to be rearranged in such a way that they still can't to this day agree of what happened, because we don't know, that God came in the flesh inside of humanity and he was born of the Virgin Mary. And the same thing is true about you, is that you were born not of the flesh only, but you were born of the spirit with which God came inside and breathed upon you new life, and your soul became filled with the spirit of God, that he would say, I am in you and you are in me. Now I want you to be filled with the spirit of God as I have told you he would come, the comforter. And he would give you all these things and he would instruct you, so you would have no need that any man teach you. You would have ears to hear, so you would have no need that any man instruct you in righteousness. You would have a heart that knows and seeks after God, so you would have no need and desire to go after all these pleasurable worldly things. But that you would seek first the kingdom of God's righteousness, because you'd be drawn to me with those drawstrings of love that, with which I envelop you and I pursue you and I bring you by the mercy and goodness of God, by grace and truth, by kindness, by gentleness, by meekness, by sufferings, Long suffering said, Have I drawn you and called you and called and equipped you and enabled you to know me in a personal and intimate way so that you would come to me as I said that I would be here. As you have heard the word and as you have listened and known me when you got saved, but you have left me because I'm no longer that important to you. Come unto me, all ye that are heavy laden, I will give you rest. I'll take your burden, I'll take your cross. But come unto me. Let me call you a son of God. Let me with power demonstrate to you why you are a son of God. Let me show you that you are meant to be one of those that has the spirit of God inside. That you could lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. That you could raise the dead. That you could walk on water. That you could say to that mountain, be thou removed and cast into the sea and it would be done. That you could look up into the heavens and see them open up and God revealed before your eyes. That you are, and you always have been, but you have not known because you've been blinded by the world and pursuing of those things. But you have been, and you ought to be, and you could be the Son of God now, today. Would you not come unto me and receive that kind of inheritance that I have provided for you? I don't know what to say more than that except to pray that you would realize just how much is contained here in verses 1 through 6 and how right here declared to be the Son of God is exactly what the gospel is all about. In verse 4 is the nutshell that's been cracked open wide of what the gospel is. By the power of the resurrection, by the power and the spirit of holiness, Jesus declared to be the Son of God, you got it. There it is, the declaration, the glad tidings, the good news, the gospel. But what are you doing with it? Are you a living gospel? Are you a son of God? Have you been raised from the dead? Have you the spirit of holiness in you? Are you now, in fact, a son of Rome? Are you, in fact, a son of Adam? Are you being declared to be a citizen of the United States of America? Are you declared to be a... Marine Corps Semper Fi? Are you an Air Force Lieutenant or a cadet? Are you of all these things? Are you part of the football team, the Baltimore, the Baltimore Ravens, the San Francisco 49ers? Are you in baseball? Are you declared to be those things? Are you declared to be a lawyer or are you declared to be a doctor? Are you declared and known as all of these things or any of these things or that's what people know you as? Because I got news for you. If that's what you're known as, you're not known by God to be a son of God. You're not. Because there's need something. Something missing in your life. There's something that just doesn't taste quite right. Something, you know, it, it, it sounds like the gospel. You know, you, you call yourself a Christian. You say the right words. You do the right things. But is there any power in your life? Is there anything there that demonstrates to us that you have the life that God has given you to live accordingly not as the flesh and the world or the Romans or the Corinthians or the Philippians or the Galatians, 
but as a son and daughter of God. Are you, in fact, one of the foolish virgins? Have you kind of like squandered away your inheritance? Are you using it for your own benefit? Have you taken the things in and accumulated them and made them yours? When God said, but I wanted them to be ours. I wanted you to invest and divest of yourself so you would invest in the kingdom of God. That you would take all of that which you have and invest it outward to all of those that have need. So that I could give you more. And it would be constantly through you that I could bless the people and encourage them. What manner of man ought you to be is what we ask in these latter days. And I can tell you exactly what you ought to be. The Son of God. Be perfect. As your Heavenly Father and your Heavenly is perfect, Jesus said. And there's only one way to do it. It's by the Spirit of God. It's by God's Spirit coming to you and you taking that quiet moment in your heart to admit the truth. You're just not there. You just don't get it or you don't have it. That maybe you need to ask someone. I mean, I've got a phone number. You can find it on my website. Call me. I don't care. If you need to talk to someone, call me. I'll talk with you. I'll pray with you. I'll make sure that you're saved. You better believe that. you got no time to waste. I'll make sure that you and I, we talk. And you got it. You get it. You get on with it. You go with it. You go with the flow and know that Jesus is loving you and Jesus is abiding in you and Jesus is taking you and Jesus could resurrect you from the dead even as he was resurrected from the dead. Because there's no reason why you can't know that. We've been given his word. We've been given the internet. We've been given the opportunities to encourage and exhort one another and help one another. But we have to pursue that night and day and day and night. This book of the law should not be ever left aside on a Sunday or Monday, or Wednesday, or Tuesday, or Thursday, but every day, all day long, through the morning, through the night, as you abide, as you sleep, as you abide, as you awake. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate on it day and night, when thou risest up, when thou goest forth. When thou art honest the way, when you're in your job, everywhere you go, and everything you say, there ought to be some kind of word coming out of you today. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, and how could you help but it burst forth from you, if Jesus is there. But are you a son of God or a son of man? The choice is yours. Be a son of the Spirit. Be born again, not of the flesh. Even if you have a thousand times asked God to come into your life and be Lord of your life or be saved. Because I got news for you. There are a lot of people that are going to be saved. Because for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Because yeah, they will perish. They're going to go right into great tribulation. They're going to die for their faith. God bless them. I don't want to go that way. We're warned about how bad it'll be. I'm going, uh, what? You know, I like the Garden of Gethsemane. Not. But I'd rather deal with what I've got to deal with today so that I can get on with it. So that when you say, come up, I'm going. I mean, I want on that privileged line where I don't have to stop and be inspected for fruit. You know, or I have to be stopped and inspected because I'm carrying guns. You who are violent ought to learn something very quickly there about that. TSA is checking you for weaponry. Guess what? God's Spirit may be leading you in some way to tell you, you need to repent. Because, you know, if you think that carrying guns is protecting yourself, you may be objecting yourself or objectifying yourself straight into tribulation period. Whether the great one or the one before, God knows. But you're going to die by the sword because you live by it. I don't want to go that way. I want to go... Yeah, daddy. <laughs> Take me away, Calgon. <laughs> oh boy, it's great. <laughs> yeah, that's a Jesus freak. So I don't know about what you're going to do, but baby, this son of God is going home soon. And you need to repent and get it right. Because if you don't, you're not living right. You're going to find out that it's not about being perfect because you're, you'll sin every day. In some way, you'll, you'll trip up, slip up, mess up. But you got to learn how to fess up because if you fess up that you messed up, then you live up to what God has done. You get it? It's easy. Watch God's spell. It's pretty easy. Yes, it's all for the best. You'll be regressed. Yes, it's all for the best. You'll be regressed. Yes, it's all for the best. Hallelujah. 
But, I mean, you got to be Pentecostal, dude. You know what I mean? You got to be charismatic, girl. You got to be right on, people. You got to know who you know and what you know. Because if you don't know, you won't go. Guess what? Son of God, son of man, son of Romans, son of Americans. I got news for you. It ain't the American dream that's going to get you into heaven. It's the American dream that's going to kill you. It's going to bind you up, bound you up, and keep you confounded and grounded in the world, not in the word. Let that be a word to you. Don't be grounded from flight by what you've done with your life. But be grounded in the word so that when it's time to go, baby, you're gone. Because either here, there, or in the air, I'll see you there one way or another. And I sure ain't not going to go heading into tribulation if I can avoid it. But I would rather you be spared of the great tribulation that you could find now that, hey, give it up. Give it up. Get real. Get on with it. Get right with God. Get to be called and declared by him to be a son of God, and then you'll know what it's like to walk in the light, as he is in the light. And you'll just look around and everywhere around the town, you'll see Jesus.